What is up, everyone? Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report, representing the first Off the Bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. Welcome in to another edition of the NFL Weekly as we inch closer to the regular season. Um, We are about 25 hours away from our first preseason game going off. Um, and it, you know, it won't mean a whole lot and we'll get over preseason very quickly, but it is football and we are getting closer. And of course, to break it all down with myself today is my co-host Raider Jim Martinez. You can find Raider Jim at Raider Jim 1090. Mr. Martinez, how are you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. Like you say, we're getting closer and closer to football season. We're in the middle of Breeders' Cup on thoroughbred racing. Life's looking pretty good. Amen. It's beautiful out. Um, there is a heat wave rolling around, but look, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know if there's a such thing as heat wave, um, in the summer, because look, let's just face it. It gets hot in the summer. That's, that's, uh, that's how it is, but hopefully wherever you are, you're nice and cool and comfortable. Um, but we are looking at the NFC North, uh, today we may have coach Lupian pop in a little later, but for now it'll just be us, uh, myself and, um, uh, Raider Jim, you can find myself at Uh, First Report, F-E-R-S-T on Twitter and the podcast network at Off the Bench. One, two, we will start at the presumptive bottom of the division. It is the Detroit Lions, uh, currently 22 to one to win the uh, NFC North. So, hey, if you're looking for a long shot, um, I mean, call me up. I'd love to take your money. But if you'd uh, rather give it to Vegas, feel free to put some money on the Lions. Obviously, the big shakeup in the off season with uh, Matthew Stafford being sent to the Rams. Um, and then Jared Goff, of course, coming to the lions. I had to, you know, go on a little earlier and, and go, man, I just don't know a whole lot of lions what's going on. And sure enough, I looked at their roster and <laughs> it's, it's Jared Goff, uh, Penny Sewell and Sage Surratt. And the former two are both, um, uh, rookies and the only reason they are kind of on my mind is because we talked about him uh, in the last you know three months as Sage Surratt was a wide receiver out of Wake Forest that I thought very highly of so at the very least they had a good draft obviously Penny Sewell personally I thought she, he should have gone to um, to Cincinnati to help protect Burrow but instead he will help protect Jared Goff a big shakeup in Detroit I don't think it would have mattered um, unfortunately Uh, This is a team that's definitely in the rebuilding stage. But Raider Jim, what are your thoughts on the Detroit Lions? You know, everybody knows, and you just said it, the big news for the Detroit Lions is Jared Goff's going to be there. Now, Jared Goff has got playoff experience. He comes from a winning program. Uh, He's not going to walk into the, uh, the coaching circus that they've had the last few seasons. It's going to look better for him that way. The offensive line, they've actually spent some money there. They've put about $46 million, I think, is where they're at right now on that offensive line. Taylor Decker, Frank Ragno, Panay Sewell, uh, Jonah Jackson. I mean, they, they're, they're looking really good on the offensive line. If they can keep him safe, uh, if they can keep Jared Goff safe, one of the things that plays in for them is the offensive scheme for the Lions is going to be primarily run and keep it to a short mid passing game. This is going to fit in real well for the Jared Goff, the Jared Goff mentality. They're not going to ask him to unleash it. You know, uh, they're not going to be the the vertical offense. It's going to be safe, safe and and run the clock. They've added Jamal Williams in the backfield, who is a a solid guy. I think that that was a great addition from them. And he came from within the conference. Uh, you know, so that that uh, that adds a little bit to the locker room talk when they go into those games. Uh, DeAndre Swift, Jamar Jefferson, th- they've got some good guys out there. Jason C- Cabinda, the fullback, uh, I, th- I think pretty good at him myself. And then on the defensive side of the ball, that's going to be where the question is. How good is the defense going to play? Uh, they've got Cornelder, they've got C.J. Moore, Bobby Price in the secondary. They've got Sean Hamilton uh, on the linebacking core. They've moved Charles Harris to the edge, and I think that's going to be a good move, but I don't know if that's going to be enough. And then on the defensive line, they are, they're a good average bunch, but they're not going to intimidate anybody. They're not going to overpower too many of the offensive lines. So it's going to be up to the offense 
to keep the defense off the field almost. You know, let's eat up the clock. Let's play a good management game on the clock. And, uh, you know, don't hit big chunks of real estate, little chunks of real estate. Give the defense time to breathe and then have the defense just go out there and do their job. I think they're going to be better than most people think. Uh, five, six wins, no problem. Uh, maybe a couple more than that. We'll see. But uh, I do like I like the direction the Lions are heading. And I have nothing, no real vested interest in the Lions. But just in looking at them, I, I like the direction that the organization is going. Yeah, I agree. If you're going to, when you, ha- when you are starting to build, obviously, look, it's a rebuild when you trade away your franchise quarterback, the rebuild has begun. And for, for you kind of brought it up. This is where you start. I believe at least the offensive line um, a- at the very point of that, you can maximize the talents of your skill position players. If you have an above average offensive line um, and, and for Jared Goff, obviously you, you brought up the kind of situation he's in there's a a lot of talk about it always kind of comes up to me the the situation of him not you know um knowing which uh direction the sun set you know every it, it was the hard well, there's that yeah and and look um i don't like to you know pick on people or anything like that or you know make a, a assumptions on one thing but um, let's just say I don't think he's going to be uh, going into the, the the brain surgery department after his playing days. But for him now, I think McVeigh was advanced. I think he was further along than what Absolutely. Jared Goff. Yeah, it was that that those formations, those offensive situations, way too much for him. He obviously um, it, it showed in that Super Bowl. Um, obviously, Belichick was able to kind of pick that apart um and you know i don't think they scored a touchdown in that game and now he goes dan campbell obviously you brought up the more run heavy situation i i think you hit the the mentality perfectly on their head they have to be a ball possession team um for multiple reasons but i would say the biggest reason is to keep the defense off the field because i do think it, this yeah. defense is a liability i think aaron Rodgers salivates looking at this um this defense um but i do think they are going to be a, somewhat i guess you know lifted up because the other two teams in this division which obviously we'll get to are not exactly world beaters i mean you could make a no. case that the lions could be better than either the vikings or the bears so this isn't a situation like we saw you know um maybe in the afc east where the jets are they're going to finish in fourth, you know, outside of some crazy stuff happening at the top of that division, the Jets are finishing last. Um, the Bengals probably going to finish last in the AFC North. This one, you know, I think we know who's going to win it, but the other, you know, two through four, you could maybe roll some dice. Now, obviously 22 to one, the betting um, does put the Lions in that situation, but great point you brought up that they are building in the right direction. Uh, right. And I, I think, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, you said you didn't have a vesting interest, but I do think all of football fans have a small vested interest in the Lions. And it's about the first game on Thanksgiving, because we all know what it's going to be. And for the yeah. last 20 years, it has been the Packers beating the crap out of the Lions. And at least going before that, you know, we had Barry Sanders for us to go, wow, uh, before we ate our Thanksgiving dinner. So hopefully, hopefully uh, the, the, the Lions can at least get somewhat um, uh, competitive, but I think it will be a couple years away before we're enjoying that first game on Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, we, nobody's going to confuse Jared Goff with uh, Aaron Rodgers in the division, that's for sure. And I do think a more uh, generic or black and white playbook is going to play to his strength. I mean, it's going to, you know, that you, you, you stand him up and the coach says, repeat what I say in the huddle and then, and then execute it and don't give up the ball. Okay, coach. And then we're, you know, that could, this is going to pay off dividends maybe for the line fan. Yeah. And moving up um, the expected standings coming in at five to one to win the NFC North. It is the Chicago bears 
This is obviously another team that parted ways with their quote unquote franchise quarterback, whether they want to admit it or not. They tried the Mitch Trubisky situation. Um, don't remind them of who they had a chance to um, draft. Bears fans get a little salty when you bring up those names. But anyway, Mitch Trubisky is now backing up Josh Allen in Buffalo. Um, Josh Fields, obviously coming from Ohio State, uh, fell. And he is going to be the uh, uh, apparent heir apparent if in uh, or in Chicago, I should say. However, there is still Nick Foles in the mix. Um, there has been some interesting news, though, as, of course, in the last few days, um, the news came out. And I mean, look, I, I don't want to see anyone get injured um, and obviously want my Eagles to do best as possible. And that first round pick they were looking at for Carson Wentz may be up in smoke already as uh, he will be out five to 12 weeks. So the whole point of uh, Carson Wentz playing 70 snaps to get a first round pick, or I'm sorry, 70% of the snaps to get a first round pick is now up in the air. But for the Colts, they are now looking around to figure out who can cover that time. Nick Foles' name has been brought up right. and a lot of people have kind of talked about the full circle that would go through. Um, and to be fair, Mitch Trubisky's name has been brought up as someone who could possibly head to Indianapolis to kind of fill in the blanks until Carson Wentz comes back. But keeping it back to Chicago at the moment, Nick Foles, Josh Fields, those two are expected to fight for the quarterback spot. Most Bears fans expect Fields to be a starter early on, maybe not right away, but early on. Um, and that's kind of a negative outlook for Nick Foles. But as me as, you know, obviously, look, every Eagle fan has a very, very soft spot in their heart for Nick Foles. I don't believe Nick is ready to just give up the reins. And I think it would be best for the Bears if they were able to ride Nick Foles um, for as long as possible and uh, have Fields take a couple deep breaths in the NFL. But for the Bears, it's about contending in this division. And they've been very, very close. This is a team that was playoff hopeful last year and then it just kind of all started to go awry when they could not figure out uh which quarterback was the right one kind of in the same spot this year but the bears looking ahead um obviously know what they need to do they need to be better than the vikings and obviously the lions um and if they can be better than the packers great but i think their goal is to finish second in this division and hope that they get one of those three wild card spots when it's all said and done Raider Jim, what are your thoughts on, um, as uh, the, the, the old SNL would say, the Bears? Yeah, I was, as I was doing the research on the four teams in this division, I just started all of a sudden found myself with a common theme. And that is, what does everybody's offensive line look like? One, you've got, you know, you've got the Nick Foles field situation in Chicago. You've got the Jared Goff situation here. You've got the changes in Minnesota. You've got, uh, of course, the the drama that is the Aaron Rodgers situation with the Packers, but the offensive line. So I, I was focusing on that. And here's, here's a pretty interesting thing I came up with. The first few games of last year, the Bears averaged 16 points a game. It was like 16.7, something like that. And then they made shifts to the offensive line. The first five games after they made those shifts on their offensive line, they went to averaging 33 points and they scored 19 touchdowns. Uh, one of the things they did was they got uh, Jermaine Fel, I can't remember, Afidi, Afidi, I think is his last name, uh, moved him from guard to tackle. Uh, they've got Notre Dame, Sam Mustafer in there, Alex Bars in there. They picked up in the uh, on the draft picks, they've got Tevin Jenkins and Larry Borum, who they, they expect Jenkins to come in and make some noise on the offensive line or competing for the offensive line. But if the offensive line uh, can gel and play like they did the second half of the season, you never know what's going to happen with that offense. They also have David Montgomery in the backfield. That guy is a beast. I really like David Montgomery. He had over a thousand, just over a thousand, but he had over a thousand yards rushing, over 40, 400 yards receiving, 10 touchdowns. Uh, they also brought in uh, Damian Williams, former chief, who sat out 2020 because of the COVID uh, protocol and, and his, you know, he decided to opt out. But that guy was a big impact player for the Chiefs when they won the Super Bowl. 
and to put him in the backfield, you've got defenses now that are going to have to really pay attention when those two guys are out on the field. Plus, they've got Arne, uh, Allen Robinson, Darnell Mooney, the second-year guy, who's going to be really good. They've got a couple other guys on the receiving core, Demir Bird, who played for uh, Belichick, and now he's playing for the Bears. And Olympian Marquise Goodwin is going to be there, and they think that he's got a good chance to make some noise this year. Six-round pick Daz Newsom is also slated to make some noise. On the defensive side of the ball, the one thing that made me smile is they were talking about the aging defense. Now, again, as a, you know, every now and then I reference, I, I don't dye my hair just to do the podcast. This is, and they talked about the aging linebacking core in, uh, in Chicago, including the superstar uh, Khalil Mack, who has now turned 30. And so it's I was like, that's the aging, that's aging, he's a 30. Uh, but they do have, uh, the, the question out there is, how many years do they have left before the 30 to the 38 year old range is gonna start to impact the defensive side of the ball? I don't think it's gonna impact them too much this year, uh, but I do think Khalil Mack needs some help out there. He's, uh, it, it was, it's the Raiders all over again, almost. He's the one guy doing the most out there. And, you know, he's 30 years old and he's talented, but at some point you need to have some support. He can't always cover, you know, he can't cover the edge in two places. And everybody knows that. Plus, everybody realizes, offensive lines and coordinators have realized, all we got to do is double up on that guy. He, and, and more and more, even though he was Pro Bowl caliber, they're going to find it easier to take him out of the schemes. Yeah, and and that, the the big thing obviously like doesn't take a rocket scientist. Cleo Max very fast and athletic, but he's going to like you said he's going to line up on one side of the formation. Um, a couple hand signals and the play is flipped, and Cleo Mack um, probably doesn't even have to be blocked because they just completely flip the play on him. Uh, and and I don't think just enough. It's just enough that you put the helmet on of the Bears. You got to put some players in the, on that defense as well. But Correct. for the Bears. They, I think, unfortunate, and I think a lot of the mindset of fans is the biggest question is, you know, who is the quarterback right now? Who is the guy? Who is going to be the guy? Right. Um, I, 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 I feel like it's early. It's way too early. And I feel in the situation, I think Fields is more talented, talented than Trubisky was. But I just worry that the Bears fall into the trap again of putting fields in early, you know, I, I'm just envisioning week three or week four, Nick Foles throws the second half inter interception at, at soldier field. And you hear the crowd starting to chant for Justin yeah. fields, you know, and it's great. It's fantastic. But does it help? Does it appease the mob? If you will? Sure. It makes them happy, but is it the right thing to do? Is it the, um, you know, the thing that later on is uh, looked at as, Hey, that worked out. I don't believe so. So it's going to be t difficult. It's almost a little ironic. You kind of wonder, would the Bears have kind of hoped maybe this past year's rules were better or were happening now where they didn't have any fans uh, in the stands? Because you wouldn't have that situation, obviously. And I've always been a big believer in the fact of the backup quarterback is one of the few positions in all of sports, not just football, but all of sports where – you cannot be more popular than the starter. It's just, it's not good for business um, because the first moment that something goes wrong, which it will for any, any quarterback, um, the fans are going to be looking for that next flavor of the week, if you will. And that could really set some people back um, and, and, and we'll see how that goes. But for the Bears, they're first and foremost, I think, having to figure out, like you said, how can they make life a little easier and prolong the career of a Khalil Mack? Because um, as of right now, he is the face of that franchise. Um, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how they deal. And the first question every single team in the NFC North, at least this year, will have to ask themselves is, how are you going to stop Aaron Rodgers? Um, and at the moment, the Bears um, have a bit of an uh, answer to that but it's, it's definitely has some holes in it. I will say the next team we're going to talk about, at least on paper, looks like they have at least a few answers. And the Minnesota Vikings, uh, when you look at kind of the, the last 10 years 
whether it's been Leslie Frazier or Mike Zimmer, this has been a team that first and foremost played stout defense. They're physical. Um, they're going to go out and they're going to try to kind of beat you into submission and kind of, you know, win those 20 to 17, those 23 to 20 games that just kind of feel like a grind. Uh, last year was not the case. Their defense well below average, according to the numbers could make a, you know, maybe a bit of the dome teams losing out a bit on the home field advantage, at least early on. I do believe maybe later in the year they had some fans in, but obviously not at the full capacity we've seen and we will see this year. But for the Vikings, a lot of the news this offseason has been off the field, or at least lately has been off the field um, and uh, somewhat dramatic, if you will. Um, we do have the news of uh, Rick Dennison, who had been with the team for a bit. He um, has left the team due to the COVID vaccination mandates. Um, we saw one of the, um, let's, I just had the guy's name. There was a defensive back who was just let go um, from the Vikings. He had a bit of a, de a domestic um, violence situation. But with all that being done, this is a team that still has the veterans um, that they've had in terms of that the linebacker position, uh, Eric Kendricks and Anthony Barr. They add Dalvin Tom Tomlinson, who is a fantastic uh, interior defensive lineman and an aging but still, still very effective and very intelligent Patrick Peterson, along with Bashad Breland and Mackenzie Alexander. So the defense is set, but all eyes for me, it all comes down for the Vikings to one man. And it's Kirk Cousins. There are very few quarterbacks that can look in the backfield and see a running back as talented as uh, uh, Dalvin Cook and look out, out wide and see for up until last year, players like um, uh, Stephon Diggs. And then still there it was, or still here, of course, is Adam Thielen and now Justin Jefferson. A ton of offensive, at least skill position talent but it has not really affected the play of Kirk Cousins, who continues to play above average at best. And last year was not the at best moments. Obviously, this is a team that just three or four years ago was in the NFC Championship game, um, getting blown out, I might add, by the Eagles. But they were in the NFC Championship game with a you know decent amount of this core still there. Um, but their big question as three to one. Um, going in to win the NFC North. Can they compete with the Vic or the Packers? Excuse me. I do think at least on paper, the defense can get the job done. But once again, what will Kirk Cousins have in store this year? Um, that is the big question. Raider Jim, what are your thoughts on the Vikings? Every All focus is on the quarterback situation in Green Bay. And when we get to Green Bay, I'll tell you why it doesn't matter what the is being said in the press or anywhere else as far as the Packers go. But with this team, I'll tell you what is in the press. And to me, it's making more of an impact and than people may realize. And that is there's some issue right now with Kirk Cousins and the front office, the coaching staff. He is just once again been placed on COVID protocol. So here we are, we're supposed to be getting everybody ready to have, you know, I don't care if he only plays the opening series in the first preseason game. How many weeks can these guys miss out with the prolonged season now? Uh, what Jackson out in, uh, in Ravens, the same thing, you know, he missed out on some time. I don't know if he's still out or not. And Kirk Cousins' position is, oh, well, too bad. I'm not getting vaccinated. And I'm not criticizing him for his beliefs and why he's not getting vaccinated. But at some point, you back the organization into a corner. And because I understand, I, if I read it correctly or if I heard correctly, I believe one of the backup quarterbacks is also uh, in the same situation. Well, that doesn't bode well when you, you, you know, for the whole offense or for the team or for the fan base. So it's going to be curious to see how this plays out. And the coach has been a little vocal about, in so many words, saying uh, it's irresponsible when you owe it to your team. And, you know, we're paying you a lot of money. The organization's paying you a lot of money. You got a lot of guys relying on you. 
and we can't put the best product out there because we can't practice because you're not here. Or maybe you're not going to be around the first two weeks of the season. Who knows? And, but, but I know Cousins' position is very, very, he's very adamant. He has come right out and said, and uh, basically, I'm not going to get vaccinated because of my beliefs. And if I were to get sick and if I were to die, I'm at peace with that, too. So when that is the mentality, wow, good luck to the front office on how they're going to address this. But I think that's going to make a bigger impact in the locker room uh, and, you know, the chemistry of the team. Uh, it's going to be evident, I think. And it's too bad because they've made some decent moves in, on the defensive side of the ball where they had troubles last year, as you pointed out. You know, they've picked up Mackenzie Alexander, Patrick Peterson. Wow, that's that's putting some effort into shoring up your secondary back there. Uh, they picked up a kid uh, who is their draft pick. First round draft pick uh, out of Virginia Tech, Christian Darasol. This kid's supposed to be one of the top three tackles, but I kind of laughed when I read that because I think that had to be the 10th top three tackle I've read about in the last three weeks. I, I don't know if there's any tackle that's been drafted. It isn't in the top three. Which, okay, you know, maybe they're just all even across the board. And, and then uh, they also picked up uh, Xavier Woods from the Cowboys. So they've made the moves on the defensive side to do that, and they've got the offensive guns to uh, be competitive. Now it's just a matter of how's the chemistry going to look. They, you know, they lost Kyle Rudolph. Uh, they they lost a cornerback. They lost a safety, but they made that back up. Is, but Mike Zimmer has his work cut out for him. Yeah, he, in, he's the. I, I think he's got the hardest job, as all head coaches do. But I think, given all the situations, and you know, if he gets the chatter, you know, if if, if the D line guys or anybody is going to their coordinator and bitching about Kirk Cousins, and I, I hear the hell we go again, or they just hear all the chatter, he it, it all eyes are on him. Then okay, how are you going to manage this? Belichick, Belichick's going to manage it, no problem. Is Zimmer Zimmer's capable, but the success, I don't know. And so with that, it, it, like you said, that really impacts and gives uh, this could be one of those things. This might be a good thing for Detroit. You yeah. never know. And Chicago for that matter, too, because right. like I said, Chicago pretty much look. You know, in those locker rooms, you'll hear a lot of Ruha and, and, you know, the sky's the limit for this team. And, and, you know, this is a Super Bowl caliber team 32 uh, in 32 cities. Yeah, I understand that. But, but I think the realistic expectation for every team not in Green Bay, Wisconsin is finish second. I don't think any team outside of the Packers right now realistically says division or bust. Um, now they'll take it. Don't get me wrong. They're going to work as hard as they can possibly get to achieve that goal if it comes their way. But those other three teams, they're looking at it. If we finish second, we should make the playoffs. Um, and as I said, you know, with the instability uh, in Chicago and, and, and the drama in Minnesota, you know, Detroit, I don't know, second might be a bit much, but I think third is definitely there possibly for the taking. And with Minnesota, Obviously, Mike Zimmer not only having to deal with, you know, a quarterback who and quarterbacks who have been vocal about um, what they do or don't want to do in this situation, losing a coach um, already, yeah. and you throw that on top of the fact that this is probably one of the uh, few coaches that is going to start the season on the hot seat. Um, you know, you, you want to talk about those Vegas future bets. Mike Zimmer is probably one of the top three to be the first person fired or be the next coach fired. It's probably Zimmer on that short list right now. So not going to be any easier. Um, you know, when you look at the off the field stuff, it's hard to be an NFL coach when it's just the on the field crap you have to deal with. Uh, when you have this extra, um, you know, I guess uh, kind of noise, if you will, that's, that's something you're not going to have to. Uh, and, and the hard part about this noise We've never had this situation. We've never had coaches quit. Um, we've never had players have to lose time um, because of this. Now, obviously last year, but we didn't have um, the opportunity uh, to, to be vaccinated in, in this situation. So it's a very, very odd situation. And for Mike Zimmer, he's probably looking around um, wondering if he can catch a break. Because I do think I remember they're about like 55 or 60%, um, one of the lowest uh, percentages of vaccination and 
Um, the names aren't exactly there, but the numbers are. It's all player A, B through whatever um, to, to look those up. But, and, and I will tell you, coming from the corporate world and seeing what this is doing to uh, an organization or organizations I'm familiar with trying to restaff their offices, their buildings, whatever, this is just the first domino because it's not just Kirk Cousins saying, I'm not getting the vaccine, I don't care. What do you do when a starting offensive lineman comes to you and says, he's not vaccinated, I'm not playing. I mean, yeah. this is a, and yeah, me either, I'm not either. I, it, this is a big can of worms. Yeah, and, and we haven't even brought up the kind of unknowns about, as we talk, I, I myself am a big racing fan, not horse racing, but um, auto racing, not NASCAR. Um, good for them. They can turn left. I'm happy for you. But um, it, Formula One is one of the crazier sports. Uh, wow. Uh, it, it's, it's crazy. But their top racer is Lewis Hamilton. He had he came out this past weekend and kind of said, you know, this this is affecting me. I had COVID a year ago and I got through it. You know, it was tough, but I'm, I'm through it. And he said there are certain days where he feels the effects. So we obviously don't even kind of know the um, beyond part of that. And, and with the offensive linemen, they're in that kind of, of any athlete out there. I think the offensive linemen are as close to that kind of danger zone as you can get, because look, they're, it's, it's disingenuous to call them the big uglies, you know? Yes. They're, they're large human beings, but for the most part, they are really, really athletic for their size. However, um, they're just, that body frame, um, the size, you know, big men fall or big trees fall harder kind of things like that. So it takes a little bit more air, a little bit more muscle to work through it. And COVID may hit these guys a little harder and maybe stay with them a little longer. That's a great point. It's kind of that double-edged sword where I lost my quarterback because he doesn't want to get vaccinated. But then I also lost two of my offensive player makers because they don't want to play with someone who's not been vaccinated. Yeah. And then and then that locker room, my goodness, you want to talk about a divide that is as plain as day because everyone now we might not know it, or at least outside of those three or four, but every single player in that locker room knows, I would assume one way or another, how players stand or how they feel one way or another. So I would agree. moving on to, of course, uh, the presumptive champs, I think of all, I guess, you know, with all due respect, maybe the AFC West probably the uh one division in football that you could probably sl slot in the division winner and it is the green bay packers currently minus 235 to win the division uh the nfc north obviously the news coming out of green bay it started draft night when as i always say aaron Rodgers refused to let us football fans think about any other anything other than the man, the myth, the legend in his mind, that is Aaron Rodgers. He came out and said he doesn't want to be in Green Bay anymore. Um, it's been pretty much the whole offseason of the Aaron Rodgers show. It came out a couple weeks ago that Aaron Rodgers will return. He is going to come and fulfill his contract um, like an adult, but that will be it. They restructured the contract so that this will be his final year. And uh, that, that low pressure system, that came in across the United States, mainly the Midwest um, that you heard or that you felt right after this was announced. That was those three fan bases um, that aren't the Green Bay Packers that just let out a sigh of relief because they don't have to deal with Aaron Rodgers anymore. Um, but for the Packers, it's first and foremost, Aaron Rodgers, even without these stories, it's going to be that Aaron Rodgers story. But uh, Raider Jim, what are your thoughts? The Packers, a team, obviously most people expect to win this division. So on August 4th at 4.40 in the afternoon, I'm going to go on record and tell you they will go 5-1 and one in division for sure. I mean, and that's, that's iffy. They may run the division. I read up on the Packers, and my gosh, they are just as good as it gets. And the Aaron Rodgers situation is real. I get it. Everything, you know, and it's one thing to be brash. And to, you know, wear a bunch of bling or carry on in a certain way. And, you know, you've got the guy down in Houston. I want to be traded. I don't want to be here anymore. What, you know what? You need to just straighten your act out. 
uh, this guy is a winner. He's a competitor. And, and he did, this was happening last year and they weren't going to start him. And then they started him. And I said, uh, my thing, if I'm the other guys is holy hell, he's going to come out with a chip on his shoulder. And that's exactly what happened. He was just lights out last year. And again, wasn't his call to not go for it in that playoff game. Let's kick a field goal. You know, I still, I don't understand that. And I know he doesn't as well. He's going to come back and play as well as he did last year, maybe even ramp it up a notch. To see them in and to win the Super Bowl would not surprise me because he's coming back with the same offensive line. Yeah, they've had the, the between season, the off season drama. But if you start reading some of the press from training camp, and when they go and they ask Aaron Rodgers, what do you think about this group, this group, this group? It's that cerebral, man, these guys are really something. He was breaking down the new defense. And I'm like, boy, for a guy who doesn't want to be there and, and anybody who's buying into that, that he's not, you know, completely, you know, buying into the, to being a Packer, you're out of your mind. He broke down that defense. He was so complimentary of that defense. And he, he, he said, you know, I'm looking at schemes. And then he was pulling the defensive backs aside. What are you guys doing? What? I've never seen this before. What are you guys doing? It intrigued him. And so, and his remark is now this defense is going to be good. Plus, he's got all his normal targets. But that, you know, let's start with, with the, you got some of the teams we've talked about to date. I was like, it's great to have a great quarterback, but, you know, what do you have protecting that quarterback? That offensive line in Green Bay is, they are the top echelon of offensive line, and they are just, they're just there. And now they have added, uh, they've added the guy from that played for Dennis Kelly. Dennis Kelly, who played for Tennessee, did all that blocking for uh, Henry and, and uh, Tannehill over there. 6'8, 321 pounds. Well, that's making a move to beef up your line that was already good. They brought in John, they've got John Runyon, they've got Ben Brandon. These are not little guys. Uh, <laughs> Elkton Jenkins, 6'5", 3'11". It is, why wouldn't Rodgers want to play there? Yeah. You know, I mean, he's not going to find that situation anywhere else. So I think they're going to be fine. Devin Funches is, is back. He's, uh, and he's excited about that. Uh, they've got uh, Jawan Winfrey's back. So they're, they're covered. And on the defense, the line is still a little, uh, that's their one and only question mark, the defensive line. But they are bringing in bodies. They're trying to make some moves. They've got young linebackers, Kamal Martin and Chris uh, Chris Barnes. And Chris Barnes is actually a top 20 linebacker by the end of the year. So, I mean, and then they've got Devondre Campbell. They got uh, the veteran to work with these two young guys. Uh, brought in uh, Adrian Amos to, you know, shore up the secondary. They did get rid of Darnell Savage, but they brought in Eric Stokes as a draft pick. I don't think the Packers are going to have a weak link in their chain. Um, I agree. I, I do feel like there may be a weak link and it may be in the coaching position, to be honest. I think Matt LaFleur obviously had a lot of questions to answer. And to be honest, I wasn't really one of those guys who jumped on him. Um, I do vividly remember that situation. Um, Tom Brady had thrown three interceptions in the second half of the NFC championship game. So it wasn't, you know, this situation where Brady was just tearing them up. Now, a couple of those interceptions were, were not really on Brady, but still, um, I do believe they had essentially four timeouts. And when I say that extra one, it was the two minute warning. Now, granted, I, you know, look, if I'm the coach, I would have gone for it. You have Aaron Rodgers, you got to go for it at that situation. But for me, I think a lot of what it is, is you get to a certain point, um, with, with players uh, that have every single player has an ego, especially an NFL quarterback. There are only 32 of them. Um, it is the most important position. It's the most scrutinized position in all of major sports in this country. And when you are good at it, it is hard to be humble. Um, and Aaron Rodgers is not humble. Uh, we had, he had his press conference where he came back and 
kind of reminded everybody, look, uh, Green Bay is in a vacation spot. They come to play with me. And it's just, you know, hey, hey you're, you're not talking about the Jacksonville Jaguars or, or the Houston Texans. You know, the Green Bay Packers were already a top five, um, you know, historic franchise before Aaron Rodgers was even a glint in anyone's eye. So back that one up, sir. Um, and it's just a little, a little disingenuous for me to see that. But at the end of the day, you brought it up. All the BS, all the kind of characterization that you can have of Aaron Rodgers, when that ball is kicked and that game starts, he is a top five quarterback. And no matter what, he is keeping your team in it. Um, you talk about the talent he is surrounded by. It's, it's really it's really good. Um, and, and I think think about Randall Cobb back as well, mm-hmm. a bit of a new or a, a bit of a you know, familiar face. You, caught, you talked about the uh, Funchess, you know, the Bunches of Funchess situation. And this defense, I, I firmly believe Drew Brees has moved on. He's retired. But the, the, the scariest thing for NFL teams are when Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers, and it used to be Drew, uh, Drew Brees and Peyton Manning, but when those quarterbacks have a good defense, because when that is the case, shut it down. Because they, you're not going to beat that team. More than likely, you brought up the five and one in the division. I completely agree. The only way they go worse than five and one, they may go four and two, but that will only be because they'll start four and oh, and their final two games of the year are against the Vikings and lions. And there's a very good chance. The division has been wrapped up by then. And Jordan love yeah. is starting both of those games, you know, um, maybe not both those games. Cause they're probably at least still playing for seeding. But you'd have to imagine going into week, you know, or game 15, that the division will be probably wrapped up for the Packers. So I agree. If they don't go 6-0 and or 5-1, and the only reason is because uh, they had to play some backups or they elected to play some backups later on in the year. But it would be a great surprise to me if the Packers don't win this division. I can't really find a way outside of an Aaron Rodgers injury. And even then, um, I still think even if Aaron Rodgers goes down, this is a team that's right there in this division because of all that talent you brought up. Um, I don't want to wish harm on anybody, but as we get closer on towards the end of the year, my only concern is this is one of the few times where it is known there is no gray area. This is it for Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. Yeah. So as we head into December, we head into every single playoff game. There will be the same narrative in every single game. It's the last time he'll play in Detroit It's or as a Packer. It's the last time, as we get later on in the season, every single narrative will be Aaron Rodgers, either last game against so-and-so or last game here or potentially last game. That's right. what the story will be. How does this team deal with it? It's always been like that. Aaron Rodgers has always been the, the center of the story in Green Bay. But it's never been a situation where, I mean, this is this is the farewell tour, and and and, and the band is not getting back together. This is never going to be a one day. Aaron Rodgers is not going to sign a one day contract and and and, and retire as a Packer. This is it. It is Super Bowl or bust, and um, it's really going to be interesting. I really firmly believe what happens this year will go a long way in terms of how or in terms of the legacy that Aaron Rodgers leaves in Green Bay, because there are very few fan bases in the league that are as, um, you know, uh, uh, passionate. And I mean, look, it's the only, that, that city owns the team. The Green Bay Packers aren't moving um, because the owner, well, the owner is the Green Bay city, uh, city council. So that's not going to happen. How did, how do those fans deal later on? Um, do we hear more, kind of sideways talk maybe after a loss and Aaron Rodgers kind of alluding to the fact that he's already looking at potential next destinations. Well, that's not very uh, genuous uh, for the fans there. So we'll see how that goes. But the story, as we said, it's all about Aaron Rodgers and that's how he wants it, that he's done his job. He won the off season in his mind. Um, and now it's time for him to keep all of us talking about him, hopefully in his situation or for his wants, to be in a positive mindset, but there's one thing about this country, um, at least the fans in this country, man, we love to see certain people fail. And oh, yeah. I don't think it's Aaron Rodgers uh, in Aaron Rodgers' future, but there are a lot of people who are waiting, 
waiting to pull up these comments and these quotes and and play them on the other side uh, after a four interception game. Once well, there's again, some guy in his basement again. right now that, that has already put together a hundred memes ready exactly. to unleash him. <laughs> just waiting, just waiting upon any little situation. He's no longer even a fan of his own certain team. He is now just a fan of whoever has a chance to right. kind of derail the Aaron Rodgers and. And we're going to see, you know, how this goes. But at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of like Derek Jeter, or actually, I'm sorry, I think Reggie Jackson said it first. They don't boo nobodies. Um, and, and that is the case. Uh, you don't really care about uh, certain, you know, there's not too many people lining up to uh, call out Kirk Cousins other than myself. But there are a right. lot of people who are lining up to call out Aaron Rodgers. But that is all we have. Uh, Raider Jim, final thoughts, anything else on the NFC North or any uh, final thoughts as we get closer and closer to the NFL season? Well, last week we talked about the AFC South and, and you know, in true fashion, that had to be one of the most disjointed podcasts we did. And it's almost fitting because of the division, if you ask me. On the other side of it, the AFC North, or the, excuse me, the NFC North, is going to be one good division to watch, I think. Every, every team. Uh, it, it's always going to be great games. When, you know, when the Packers, no matter who the Packers are playing, but when the Lions are playing the Bears, that's going to be a good game this year. Uh, and when the Vikings are playing anybody, it's going to be good uh, intercon interdivision games. So looking forward to it. I agree. I agree. And um, look, at the end of the day in this division, this is the end of an era. This from we go into next year, I can guarantee you one thing. Unless... You know, Justin Fields wins MVP this year, comes out of nowhere, or Kirk Cousins turns everything around and turns into an MVP candidate. I guarantee you, this time next year, when we're talking about the NFC North, we are not talking about one of these four teams as a minus 235 favorite. That will not be the case. The years of the Packers and in this division are probably going to come to an end. Um, and once again, that that's assuming... Um, that Jordan Love isn't the second coming of, you know, like it seems like the Packers, you know, the, the Browns look at the Packers quarterback situation over the last 20 years and just shake their head that they could seamlessly go from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers just like that while they've gone right. through pretty much the entire, um, you know, cast off of first round picks uh, in, in college football. But it's going to be interesting. And at the end of the day, once again, as we finish up this podcast, we are closer to figuring out all of these question marks we have for these divisions. And we're one um, step closer to figuring out where Aaron Rodgers goes next year, because believe me, if you think that Aaron Rodgers is going to be qu a quiet free agent next year, uh, you haven't been paying attention, but anyways, thank you all so much for listening to this week week's edition of the NFL weekly presented by the first off the bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. Thank you all again so much for listening. It is time for you all to go wash your hands and stop hating everybody. We will talk to you all very soon. Peace out.